Hi, this is Greg Hildebrandt. I've been a professional artist for 62 years. I've done a lot of artwork in that time, and I'm still just trying to get it right. Greg, how are you doing, sir? Good. How are you doing, Keith? I am doing well. And uh, hello to the people that are already viewing. Uh, good to see your little icons there again. And uh, so hello. If you have any questions, comments, uh, or anything you want to ask uh, Greg Hildebrandt, please type it in and we'll get to it. So uh, what are we doing today, sir? Well, I'm going to continue this painting of Godzilla fighting Tiamat, the five-headed dragon from Dungeons and Dragons. We started this last week. And I just want to recap the procedure I use. The first, this is a private commission for a collector. And first is the sketch. I do this drawing. Whoops, let me get this straight here. I always get really backwards, you know, on the screen. So you, there, I do a sketch. He approved it. Then I blow it up on, on my uh, copy machine to the size that we determined to do the painting. And this is, this is what this is. And then, so I'll, put, I'll peel this back. Here's the painting so far. Uh, this is acrylic paint. I use acrylics on canvas. And I start, first of all, by painting the canvas black. I put two coats of Mars black on the canvas and then a coat of Doxazine purple, which is this very deep, intense purple, which I paint all my shadow colors to. And this, I started last week, we started right here with the atomic breath of Godzilla. And then I painted some of the, the dragon, one of the dragons here, the breath, to get the lighting right. So you got these principal two colors of light up here from the fire, the yellow, orange, red fire, and his blue, white breath, which lights up everything down this way. So, and then there's fire in the distance, you know, with all the wreckage. This is like in a not in a city, which they generally are battling in all the time. How many cities have they reconstructed in Godzilla movies? A you lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Hong Kong got it this time, but good. Yes. Boston in the last one, right? But I mean, over the years, I mean, it's like incredible how many cities get wiped out. Uh, well, in this, in the, in the latest one, Florida got it too, right? Or at least yeah. one. Yeah. Yes. One, uh, yes. Building. Yep. <laughs> But here, there's no city wipage out. It's just all rocks and everything. I'm going to put this little guy down. You see him down here? Yes. Even though he's, he's in the yeah. foreground at some distance from these guys, just to give it some kind of scale, you know? Okay. And because he's out here, he's what? He's about that big. Yes. He, you know, like this. So these guys, I think I think Kong in this, like Jim was doing some research on it. Kong was like, how many feet tall, Gene? 375 feet tall or something like that. In the new one. In the new one. The original and King Kong. Greg is 335 feet tall. 335 feet tall. Which, of course, the original uh, Kong, the, the, the Cooper film, and Sh Willis O'Brien puppet was, of course, only 18 inches tall. But he was supposed to be about 50 feet tall in that film. And that's kind of like the beginning. And then he keeps, then the Toho one where he battles Godzilla, the guy with the costume. That starts to get the big size change, right? Anyway, whatever. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. So what, um, I see you've got the lights turned on. Uh, yeah, the lights are turned on. Here. Yep. Not not everything is, is completely lit up yet. That's why we still have the black spot of the dragon. But uh, what particular parts are you working on today? I don't know. I'm just putzing around. I'm, I'll probably work on Godzilla a bit here more yet. <laughs> in this area up in here, I think, maybe. Uh, so, you know, and again, I've used, I've got a, another thing that I have here, Gene got me, was this dragon model, I mean, uh, Godzilla model, that I can, I put in there, in lighting. You have to turn them at all these different angles to get the body parts lit right. But, I, you know, I did this kind of gig, lit them up with colored lights that I have. To sort of approximate what I'm after, you know. Okay. And you get, you know, the the shape that way, and the way the light hits and everything. 
and you know it's not like I'm copying the photos they're they're a point they're a reference points you know Jesus, stop saying you know. I always say you know. It's kind of like. But you don't have to repeat me. <laughs> so you got this blue color, which be, when the blue here goes into this color on the the warm color on the top, I go through a like a magenta. Well, ma actually magenta. The gentle with white in it is a it's a mid range value between this highlight color and this highlight color, the blue. So it's you're just going from a fire red you're, you're, to a your voice is breaking up, Keith. Keith, you're, you're kind of like breaking up. I didn't quite understand what you said. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me clearly now, Greg? Now no, I can hear you. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I said, so you're going from the fire red through a magenta into the purple? Into the blue. Well, it goes, it into can the go blue. from the, the, this goes from yellow to orange to red, cadmium red light, straight out of the tube, and then magenta with white in it, and then down in here, it's purple, vaccine purple with white in it, into the blue. So you're basically going on the color wheel, you know, the, or through the rainbow, yep. how the rainbow works, how the, you know, the prism. Because if you no, try to no. jump. Why, what? Why don't you go straight from the, why don't you go straight from the fire red right into the blue? It'll turn to mud. Let me see what that looks like here. Here. On here, let me see. Here is cadmium red. Right. Do it, can you do it a little bit larger? What? Can, can you make your? Uh, can you do your sample a little bit larger? Yeah. Wait a minute. Let Stand me grab up. a piece. Let me grab a piece of paper. There's cadmium red. See it? Yep. Cadmium red light. If I go right to the light, light value of blue, that's this right there. See that light value? That's thalocyanine yep. blue with white in it. That's this color. See it there? Yep. Yeah. Watch well, what happens when I mix it into the red. Go a little bit larger with that? Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Can you bring that a little bit closer to the camera? Got you. Okay. See, now, it, can, it, you, can you show us? With magenta? It goes like a, gray, a dirty gray color. Yeah. It's just a yeah muddy grayish something, greenish. And you could paint that way. I mean, you could paint a picture that way. I uh, But I choose not to. Can you Do show us go what through? it looks like uh, on that paper going through the magenta? Yeah, right now. There's magenta. Can you see it? Yep. I don't know if that reads or not. It does. That's very, very clear demonstration. So it basically, the color wheel, you can't leap from red to blue, even though they say if you mix red and blue, it turns out purple. It turns out mud, literally. It, it depends, I suppose, on the colors of red. I'm talking about these cadmiums, in the particular cadmium light. E even if you mix that with ultramarine blue, it'll even get worse. Now, uh, I correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that cad red light, is more of a uh, an orange toned vermilion, for lack of a better term, red orange. Red. Yeah, red orange. It, and then cadmium red medium is is a is a less yellow red. The cad, 
it's the less yellow. Then there's cadmium red deep, which is moving towards purple, you know? In a sense, it's moving towards purple, which is between red, purple, blue, you know? Are you there? Deep into the what? blue. What? <laughs> I'm you gonna hang up and out, call man. you back. I'm gonna hang up and call you back. All right. So the thing when I'm painting this kind of like how far do you want to make your light travel? You know, it comes here as the the light is the brightest on an object when it's obviously closer to it. As it gets further away from an object, it gets less light on it. So, and that's kind of like an artistic decision. You know, how, how far do I want to make this orange color travel? And I'll probably start to diminish it here. I got a little bit on the leg here, which I'm starting to mess around with as a halfway color. Let's try. That was to put some of the magenta on there because this is a combination of blue and that blue and that orange hitting the top of the leg here. And the blue is hitting from the front. This fire is hitting on the top of the leg. How you doing, Greg? All right. How's everything? Sorry, I, I moved locations. Uh, you what? Apparently, it's one of those days. One of these technological days. Yeah. My apologies. It's all right. Well, what are you going to do? Uh, We're well, here. To move locations and change my background up because I have my kids' paintings back there. So I was just talking about light traveling you know uh, when you're closest to the light source is closest to an object it's the brightest and as that parts of the objects get this creature get body parts get further away from the light source it starts to get duller and it becomes more or less an eyeball thing you know how, how far do you want to travel with that light to bring out certain shapes you know so there's some yeah. of that orange light which is shooting over the top like this is coming down on the, on the top of his thigh here you know, yes. and, but, and then you got the blue light coming from this side hitting on it. So that's that's cadmium red light here going into the magenta and then purple because you're further away from the orange light and you're moving more towards the blue light. So that's dioxazine purple right now. And then I can let me see what happens if I put some. Some. See, this light here is traveling here. Can you see that, Keith? Yes. So you get the blue light here, and it's going into that orange light on the top, and you got to keep fudging it so it doesn't turn to mud, you know, where the purple meets the blue, and, you know. So it's like, uh, you know, it takes work. Now, now the, like the, the flames, right, you know, like right when you're up, near the mouth where that's like the most intense part right here yeah yeah that's not even as bright as i'm going to get it yet i haven't worked on this at all yeah 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 you, you know that the acts is... as a spot the what as that as that flame gets further and further away that stuff starts to take on the ambient light uh yeah cast right yeah well i mean it becomes it goes into uh this is cadmium red light then i set the mix in magenta into that straight cadmium red straight magenta and there you can see it on the edge because that's going into this slightly blue background mm -hmm. i don't know if you can tell it there the magenta is a great color and purple uh, to make those transitions from warm to cool to keep the color from getting you know gray and muddy and dirty yeah. looking you keep uh, uh, you know pure color and again like i say 
there's nothing right or wrong about either way. Just a, it's a choice. That's all it is. You know? Yeah. It's a choice. Might look a little. It it, it looks a little cleaner, and and again, in my opinion, of what how you're doing it. Yeah, it's cleaner, yeah. and I think for the subject, it's kind of appropriate because you're dealing with this wild setup and event and just blasting atomic breath and this fiery dragon breath. I mean, you want color to be, you know, cranked yep. up to get as much out of the color as you can possibly get. In I'm the- going to, I'm going to address a question here. Uh, David Ships, to answer that question, those sketches uh, are given to Gene, his agent, and then she turns around and she sells them uh, either via eBay or previous to this past year, they would take them to comic conventions and stuff like that uh, and sell them through sketch boxes. But you could still get them all the time in different different locations, uh, any of his pre- preliminary sketches. It, it's a good way to own an original Hildebrandt at uh, really a fraction of the cost of an original thing. Your your voice is getting very strange. You right? Are you there? Well, anyway, here we are again. I'm still now. There's so you've, you've got a the orange fiery orange light yellow at the core, yellow and white at the core, and the blue light, which is uh, thalocyanin blue and white at the core. And then in the shadow zone where there is no light hitting is the shadow color of the true color of Godzilla. The true color meaning he's grayish. So I mix up a dark shadow color here that would be the shadow color of Godzilla in a white light so that I know that that's the neutral color. I don't know if that makes any sense or that's understandable. Is there anybody in there? (laughs) Yeah, not if you can hear me, Greg. (laughs) I can hear you. So here you got got this, all these... I lost all the comments. I lost the comments, but the last one I saw, um, uh, someone asked if, you know, you pl- you plan uh, your stuff pretty meticulously before you start painting. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. However, do you ever have uh, happy accidents? Run? You run? You mean run-ins? You mean freakouts? You mean... <laughs> I don't know how happy those accidents are. <laughs> Well, anything <laughs> most of the time it ends up like it, yeah no but i guess so i mean a lot of the times it's like oh my god what the hell where do i go from here oh and i stare and i study and analyze because i mean to me painting is most of the work is done you know just sitting and staring I remember John Houston said that once. I remember seeing him in an interview. He was a great director. He said, yeah, it, it took me years to convince my wife that I was working while I was, while I was sitting and staring out the window. <laughs> Which is it's true. true. Yeah. It is true. Absolutely it is. I mean, you make, you make a whole movie in your head, or at least a sequence yeah. or a scene, right? Same with this. You know, you, you, once I define, I, I can't do that while I'm doing the, I do with the layout phase. I'm thinking, but when the pencil hits the paper to come up with the composition, that's, I got to watch, the pencil's got to be doing a bunch of shit. But when I, so once you get, then you determine, when you know this, this breath color is going to be this color, and this breath color is going to be that color, that's going to be the primary source of light, except for the back light, which is all fire. So then you, you sit and analyze and think about that. To me, you it's like a contemplative situation. A lot of it is just, analysis and again then you get i get the model and i shoot it 
And, but that's, so right from the very onset, you're thinking, you're thinking and analyzing right straight on through. So by the time I get to the paint here, here's my palette for the warm colors. By the time I mix, I'm ready to mix that up, I know exactly what I want. There's no guesswork. And each pile of paint from the light, from white to cadmium red, uh, cadmium yellow light, cadmium yellow medium, cadmium orange, cadmium red, cadmium red with magenta in it, cadmium red with, with, with purple, that mixture here, put down here with purple in it. That's my palette for the warm colors. And I keep them clean piles as much as I can like that all the while I paint, not muddying it all up with a bunch of glop coming in from all over the place. Yeah. So I know that I'm keeping the colors clean. And again, I think I talked about this last week. Tim and I evolved that method because we I had a twin brother and we painted together. And if one guy had to take the palette home and work with it to his house, it had to be very succinct and clear. And I know that, you know, like an individual painter, and sometimes when I, when I paint certain pictures on my own, uh, I don't do work that way. I do work that way, but then I'll add a whole bunch of additional stuff in the shadow colors and stuff, you know? Okay. But this, anyway, whatever. I don't know if that well, it's, it's a very efficient method. Uh, yeah. You know, where you're, you're just, you're working it out ahead of time. Yep. But I like, I like what color does, you know, you know, the, there's a kick to it. You know what I mean? When you're, when you're putting down the, this, this magenta color, and then with the with the uh, with the red. And uh, you know, I got two uh, two questions for you. Greg. Yep. You know, uh, we're now doing these live streams. You know, this is you know you, you've come up with these methods, which over the years uh, made it easy for you and Tim to work together, uh, whether you were in the same studio or separately. Mm -hmm. But also, it allowed you to to develop. Uh, speed right you know one of the things that you guys are, are known for uh is creating a large amount of work in a very short period of time right you know whether whether it was the tolka calendars the uh the marble masterpiece cards or you know whatever you're very efficient and you're very prolific now now doing the live stream right yeah. With working on working on this commission, just you've slowed down this particular painting just so that we could do it live. Yep. I stopped working on it last weekend. Well, we, we did it live last weekend. And then I worked for about two hours since then, putting some other stuff in just to kind of like move it along a little bit. And the I, I most of it I did today. But I mean, I did some other work during the week. I mean, I didn't just. Yeah, throw. yeah. You're not sitting around right. doing other stuff. But has that has that thrown off your, uh, like your work patterns of no. now putting it to the side to specifically Matt. do it on Thursday? No, it's all a matter of control. I mean, you know, I've been doing this. I'm I'm 82. I've been doing it professionally since I was 18. You kind of learn how to kind of like, especially in the operations that I've been. I started in animation in Detroit. That's a very precise art form. You, you learn yes. procedure, you learn clarity, you learn efficiency, you learn all that stuff. You know, there's almost no room for mistakes because you don't have the time to make mistakes. And yeah. you figure it all out and you think about it and you analyze it. And it has to be, I think, the main driving force in your life or else you won't, you, you know, it just, it takes too much to, to do it. You have to keep at it till you get there. But you can get there yeah. if you stay at it. Yep. You know, one of the things that that re reminds me, uh, you know, do you know who Steve Jobs is or was, you know? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, right. I live in a cave, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that deep. Right. No, and he would wear he would wear the same thing over and over again because it was one less thing to think about. Yeah. And that's kind of you've developed that that method. Now it changes from painting to painting. The colors change from painting to painting, but the method is still the method. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, that, that's kind of what that reminds me of. You don't have to worry about that 
step in the process. No. You could focus all of your energy right in front of you. Yep, exactly. That's the deal. Now, someone asked, you know, a question. This is aside from Godzilla. In the Marvel Masterpieces, did you paint Electra with no hair? Electra with no hair? I don't remember. It's a long time ago. Yeah. Okay, so Philip Borkin. Sorry, we can't answer your question right now, but we'll look at that painting again and yeah, I, I don't remember to answer you next week. <laughs> I can't remember whether I did or didn't. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't remember your Electra painting. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm trying to remember it myself. Dean thirteen says he's amazed that you rarely get any of the paint on you when you hold up the the paintings which yeah that part's true but have you seen the front of his shirt dean he wipes his brush <laughs> okay yeah that's you know what that's a very that's another thing of an effective method that you have developed over the years greg's painting shirts right <laughs> so here's the secret to greg's painting shirts he uses those shirts instead of a rag that's it right, right? there or I used to have a towels. rag. Of, well, I mean, look, I, I, they're my, my pants are the same. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. if you figure the rag was always on my lap, and then I wipe it, and then I get it on my clothes. So what the hell? So I wait till clothes got old or frayed or something. I just use them. You know? Yeah. yeah. You ask many questions. Not enough, though. Well, you have many answers. <laughs> uh, you need more questions? Uh, so, now, Greg, see, you know, from the last week, you've got that wing uh, coming in, right? Yeah. Uh, how, Not there yet, believe me. How are you balancing out? Wait, what was that? It's not there yet. It's getting there. Oh, okay. So you're not finished. No, no, no. You're it's blocking not. it in. So how do you take into account... Uh, like the material of the wing, well, the light behind it, and how much that glow light hits. A lot. I mean, you have to kind of consider there's a certain amount of transparency that I like, even though it's a dragon wing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you want a little bit, like this one is the red side here. That's being lit from the back. You can't readily see it on the on the screen here, but this is, these are the, this is, red this is not this is a uh, raw sienna with purple in it believe it or not and and red light into the raw sienna and purple but this is straight these are straight reds so that's the red side of the wing backlit from these fires and this will be backlit to some degree and i want to show that more less red quality about it you know okay which, which becomes kind of like you paint it till it looks right who is who is that again that said that it's got a Neil Adams it's got a it's got to be right or look right yeah right I'll add to that I always uh, I always quote Joe Kubert in in these things um he, you know he said you know it has to his was very similar to that uh, you know be right or look right if it looks wrong even if it's right it's wrong exactly I like that one. It's true, too. Yeah. Even if it's right, if it looks wrong, it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. But here's me. I mean, I, I, I have a tendency to move into these kinds of lighting setups where I get a lot of rim light, you know? Yep. That, that again, some people may say, well, wait, how can you do that all the time? Well, because I like to, you know? And it, I think it brings out shapes. And it adds to the drama of the scene, I think. Yes, I agree. It, you know, helps define that silhouette. Yeah. Yeah, now, that's the issue there, yeah. Okay, go on. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm, I have one more question just because I'm curious to how the wing is gonna work. Um, now, his, the spines on his back glow, right? So or will some of that blue be going? Well, it depends. I thought so yeah, at first. I thought so at first. 
Oh, wait a minute. I'll be right back. Wait a minute. I had something mm -hmm. here. What the hell did I do with it? Shit. Uh, I cut out a paper wing shape. I don't know where I put it, though. Oh, here it is. I cut this shape out. Okay. You know, it got light on it. You know, seeing how it would angle. You know what I mean? Yeah. How to do that. But this, this is like this. It's going back. It's not like this. It's going like this. You see? Okay. Yeah. It's not like that. It's going like this. So it's going, moving away from you. It's too far in the back for that blue to do any, have any impact on lighting it up. You get me? Because the blue, yeah. the blue, the blue is here in the foreground. It wouldn't reach out there. It's not bright enough. It, it fights with the color that's already there. If that value's lighter than the source of light here, well, that neutralizes this source of light. It wipes it out. See what I'm saying? These edges aren't done yet. These are going to get glowier. You know what I'm saying? Yes. That's interesting. So that the the more dominant light source will just wipes wipe out yellow out. light, cancels it. So that's that's where that's why that's why I like to light stuff up like this, because I'll, you don't you you have very clear areas of light. There's a light here that's direct here. There's a light here that's from the back. It's so if you were to move that around the front, well, they would all merge together. So you got to keep your lights very separate from each other to make sure that all the colors. That you're after get defined, you know? Yeah. Because if you move them all together from the front, it all just turns to white light. You know? Yep. So this there's a dragon head here that he's squeezing. And that head will be lit up from this blue and from the top from the orange. And I don't know yet. I may be I think I may. Here is the tongue of the dragon. While you're painting that in, I'm going to address a comment. Uh, What's that? Yeah, Elijah. Elijah says, you know, he thinks that the rim lighting is especially good at catching the eye from a distance, which is great for posters, T-shirts, and things like that. Absolutely. Which that's exactly why you do it, right? Is that yep. you want to make that immediate impact on the viewer? Yep. You got a fraction of a second to make an impact. I forgot what the hell it is. It's like a book cover. I remember when I used to do a lot of paperback covers. You had, I forgot they had it all timed out back in the day when I was doing a lot of stuff for Valentine. How long you had, you go into a bookstore, and unless you're looking for a particular author, it doesn't matter, right? You're looking for that author. But if you're just perusing a book paperback, it's the covers that get you. And you've got yes. that much time to get somebody and a profusion of covers. So clarity is the best thing. Readability is the best thing. You know? That that it reads right off the bat. A nice bold statement. Yeah. So now here, like there he's clutching her head is a female dragon. Or females? Does it got five heads? Is it plural or singular? What would that be? Mm. I, don't know. I think it would all depend. It would depend if they have multiple brains and different personalities. Well, I would assume they all do by the parents. I don't know. Somebody who knows Dungeons and Dragons will tell us, but they all have definite personalities in terms of their physical appearance and color. Each one is a different color and a completely different structure of their, their horns and everything. But in any yeah, event, so, yeah. Uh, no, I was just going to go on. So is is the dragon a singular dragon or is it conjoined? Yeah. <clears throat> That's like a Siamese twin sort of like thing. Yes, the conjoined twins. That's what the, uh... Well, in any event, this one, I'm thinking maybe, like he's clutching her neck, you know, like this kind of thing here, which will be defined. She's got her eyes closed, ah, you know, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know, uh, probably. 
just to get some light here, maybe, is to do her last gasping breath kind of like thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, ah, you're sputtering. We're gonna, uh, you know? got another comment here, Greg, where I'm going to have you, you're going to comment on this. Okay. Uh, uh, you, viewer North Free says, you know, he loves how Greg always talks about the importance of light. Too many artists concentrate on composition and their work uh, lacks life as a result. However, yes, Greg always talks about light. Light is very important, but you do say that composition is first and foremost. Number one. And I'm not the one that said that. Howard Pyle said that, the great grandfather of American illustration. Absolutely number one is composition. Position of the objects within the picture plane. Primary center of interest, secondary center of interest, third set. How to circulate the whole thing. Like I said before, this thing compositionally is a triangle, which is a powerful image. And it's also circular because you have the wings going around here, you see? You've got a, a triangle and a circle. That's composition. Anyway. That's composition. Placement of all the objects. Key. Because how many pictures have you seen in the past where they're magnificently painted, but they're, something about them isn't like quite as bam because it's off. Something, the, 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 the primary was center of interest is way in the corner, off too much or, you know? Yeah. So the great light. That really goes back to the Renaissance days, right? Where the, the golden tri or the golden means and. Yeah, yeah, and the romantics. I mean, who, who what's the one in the Met? The death of Socrates, is that? Angra or David? I, I always get him confused. Uh, but he's sitting. I'm not sure. in, you know that picture? He's sitting. I do know the picture, yes. Did that composition, bam, right? It's so strong and formal and powerful. Then, of course, you can take a composition like Degas, where he would off-center stuff. He knew what the hell he was doing. It, it looks like he wanted that feeling that you kind of walked in on something. Mm -hmm. and got a snapshot, sort of where it wasn't perfection in terms of composition, you know? But that takes yes. knowing composition like crazy to do that, to pull it off and not have it you just have be know, a mess. Know the, rules before, know the rules to break them. Right. So composition is <laughs> critical. I, I never, that's number one. I've said this before, I think we, we were talking, Keith. Comp, in my opinion, composition is number one. Drawing is number two. How well drawn is everything in the damn picture? Rocks. Clouds, fire, shapes, d dragons, whatever. You know, how well drawn is it? Then that's number three. Number four is lighting. How is it lit? Dark against light, light against dark. And color would be last in a sense. As much as I love color, it really yeah. is not something that I really even think about because once you define the setup the composition this particular say this one you know what the colors are going to be it tells you what the composition and setup and event tells you what the colors are yep. and characters and environment yep. that tells you what the colors are already you yep. see yep but you're you you have a particular obsession with light <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that uh, Tim and I always said that we did our own photography, we did photography professionally. And, and I mean, and that, going back to the movies, I think, you know, Technicolor film and black and white movies that we used to go to the Saturday matinees and sit there all day long and watch movies. That was the that we were really aware of lighting back then. And Disney and, and you know, early stuff, Snow White, Pinocchio, you take it where the light is very pre predominant, the sense of lighting in, in that film. Mm -hmm. And that really, I saw that when I was five, and that really impacted us, both of us. Yeah, that's always been been a, a critical issue. So. Now, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name, Adam uh, Cheat. Uh, 
you know, what was it like when you worked with Tim at the same time? Uh, was it hard for you guys? Was it easy for you guys? Well, no, it was easy. Uh, it was like one person working actually, because remember we were twins. So we, we were, we were, we started together in the womb, you know, simple as that. I mean, and then when we, 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 we were both obsessed with art equally. And we, we, it was like a single unit working in a sense, the, the two of us, because we would, we would uh, work on everything together. We work on our own stuff too, individually, but we would always come together and work on things from a very, very early age. We used to make a lot of costumes. Once I remember making a dinosaur suit, a T-Rex, and Tim, and my dad worked at, he started at GM in the stock room, worked his way up to head of office supply for Chevy back in the day. And, you know, we lived in Detroit and he worked for GM, the main building down, downtown. And he, we had a constant supply of raw material, like masking tape and mm -hmm. dust cloths. So dust cloths, are used to, literally, they were what? Unbleached muslin is what it was. And he'd bring out home yeah, okay. giant boxes of it. So I remember once making, we'd start with the suit. We, we started to build up around, one guy would stand there, and we'd start to build up our, on a pair of pants, an old pair of pants, stuff it with newspapers, start to wrap masking tape, sculpting the legs of a T-Rex until it got to the top part of the body. And we would, Tim would crawl out of it, and then I would go get into it so he could work on it for a while. And then we'd shape the whole tail out of, a lot of newspapers and papers wrapped with masking tape, and it came up to a midsection. I wish I had the damn thing. Man. It would midsection, and we'd start to build the top section with the arms like this, you know. And, but we would be doing this like together, and, and I'd be ma making a mask on his face with a piece of cloth and sculpting and carving, or you know, with tape and, and paint and everything. So we, we worked on everything together. So there was never a problem. We were two different personalities completely, completely two, two different people when it came to outside work. But when it came to work, art, we were one person. One vision. Never fought yeah. about it. Fought about a lot of other stuff. Never fought about that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, man. Yeah. Yeah. But you see here, I don't know, maybe I'll make this dragon here belching out a last little piece of flame. Kind of like <coughs> some smoke and stuff. It's like a little little lick of flame coming up. Yeah, smoke coming out, you know. Yeah. What's the, David Bunn wants to know, what is the most iconic setting you have destroyed on canvas? <laughs> Holy crap. Oh, well, unlike Chesley Bonestell, the great science fiction fantasy and matte painter in Hollywood who destroyed New York. Do you ever see those paintings he did of atomic bomb blasts no. in New York? Oh, my God. Look them up. They are freaking okay. overwhelming. I've never done anything like that. Uh, come to think of it, I can't. I don't know. I mean, it's how many Marvel masterpieces that we've done with destroyed buildings? But they're never was any... anything. Was anything being destroyed in that civilization painting, or were they, or were the settings just there? Settings were just there. Wow. Yeah, I don't think there was too much wreckage. That was a funny painting because you had to do this battle scene. Catherine the Great fighting. The, the only thing they requested was Catherine the Great fighting Genghis Khan, and then they said mix in all the other things you want. So I had jets dropping napalm in the background. I had a Sherman tank from World War II. <laughs> but they said, no blood. <laughs> had all these dead soldiers on the ground, but no blood. It was no like, blood. how do you do a war scene with no blood? But that used to be the film industry, Hollywood. You could never show blood. Which always well, looked so painless, good. right? Somebody gets shot, like, oh! But never look like they get hurt. It's, I think, I don't know if that's still the case. Like, uh, when we, we were doing magic, uh, we, you couldn't paint blood. I have yeah. Like, I did a painting arrow sticking out of the guy's chest. <laughs> but, well, there was one point. Was, yeah. I remember there was one point where you could, it's all right, I think it shows some blood like on a ship, but you couldn't show an exit wound. 
you know? Yeah. No. I, I, but real, real warfare, fake warfare on paper like that is forbidden, but real warfare is okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And it, that makes too much money to not be fine. That's right. <laughs> that's a weird, <clears throat> very strange hypocritical dichotomy, is it not? Seemingly. Seemingly. But that's a whole other yeah. story. Yeah. Here we are in <laughs> fantasy <laughs> land, not reality land. Yeah. Not reality land. <laughs> so it's better, it's better to land. fight battles this way. Anyway, what was that, Keith? I agree. So we'll move on. And uh, you've, you've talked about this it, uh, on, on other episodes, but it's always worth talking again. Uh, Lance, so again, sorry if I'm butchering last names. Group, uh, how do you resist the lore or the allure of, of digital art? Does it have uh, an allure to you? Uh, no, I don't know anything about computers, so it has no allure. I'm totally flabbergasted by what people do on a computer. You know, it, it's amazing to me. I have no interest in it. I'm, again, yeah. like I say, I'm 82. And why the hell would I want to learn how to work a computer and do art with? I mean, it would take me another... Al Hirschfeld, you know, the great Al Hirschfeld yeah. said that in an interview. I remember seeing years ago, somebody asked me, would you like to work, learn to work to do this, ink, your ink drawings in a computer? Well, why would I do that? It took me a whole lifetime to learn this. It would take me a whole other lifetime to learn that in a computer. Why would I want to do that? Because what I would be after is trying to do a painting with a computer when I've got real paint here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and ultimately, you don't end up with a real object that's handmade. I'm still an old fart. I'm old-fashioned in the sense that I like handmade stuff. I really, yeah. you know, it's like that's why I love the early animation. I don't care if it's Disney or Warner Brothers or who the hell it is. Max Fleischer. You, I watched a movie like Popeye or Snow White or Betty Boop. All that's handmade. I everything that you see on that screen is handmade. It's artists sitting there painting a background. It's artists sitting there on animation paper drawing sketches. It's an anchor inking it. It's an opaque or opaquing it. It's all hand. That appeals to me. I like to know that it's handmade, you know. Yep. It, and that's just a, that's a that's a that's my era. That's my that's what I'm used to. That's all that is. But computer art blows me away when I see it. You know, it's like incredible. Yeah. It's a it's a tool. Uh, it's just like anything else. It's a tool. Yeah. You're, you're you're in a you're in a fortunate position. Um, for yourself in that with what you're doing and creating commissions or cover paintings or, or whatever else, uh, you don't need the computer to do it. I mean, certainly, you know, they, you know, the production team behind you scans it, photographs it, sends it off to go be printed. Yeah. But, um, you know, like with me, I, right. you know, I do work in, I do I, both. I know. I was, I was almost exclusively digital for yeah, almost two decades. Really? <laughs> right? That long? Wow. Yeah, yeah a long time. Um, but your painting is incredible. It really just, it really just flip, flip back to, to do all of it traditional. But like with, you know, I, I work in advertising, you yeah. know, as you know, when storyboards and stuff like yeah. that. And at the, the way they're done and with the speed that has to turn around, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to do them of course. using paper. Of course. Uh, hey, look, at if I was younger and I was in the business starting or halfway, you know, whatever, in it for a while, I'd be doing that too. There'd be no two ways about it. But yep. at this stage, it's kind of pointless, you know, yep. for me. It doesn't, I mean... If it, if I was in your in your situation where I had to produce, you know, like that, yeah, I, I would, I, I would see myself doing that. Not, but, uh, not now, you know. <laughs> yeah, because you but, know, in the, it's whatever's the fastest and most efficient, uh, I guess, for the job at hand. But with what you're doing there's two parts to the job. There's the, the commercial job aspect of it. And then there's the resale 
aspect of it. Yep. You know, the, the selling of the tangible product. Right. And uh, yeah. So. And doing commissions, private commissions like yep. this. Yeah. Which the gentleman, this, he has hired, commissioned 40 artists so far to paint Godzilla in various modes, he, right? He, he loves Godzilla. Yeah. That's really, I like that. <laughs> Oh, I like I like, I like uh, people with obsessions. I mean, come on, what the hell is this all about? Uh, doing art is an obsession, you know, driving, yes. you know, obsession. That's, yep. that's what it's all about. And loving it and enjoying it. And... So here's, here's a, someone has this question, which you've only been on the periphery of this, this okay. conversation. I keep spraying um, paint here, wait a minute. Yeah. 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 What are your, what are your thoughts on NFTs? <laughs> well, every time I hear that, what I think of is LSMFT. <laughs> Lucky strike means fine tobacco. If anybody can remember that, that used to be no. Lucky Strike's ad line. LSMFT. Lucky strike means fine. That's what I think of. So I don't. I, I heard that. Gene's <laughs> been. You guys have been working on that, and other people keep talking about it. And I, you know, there's a big thing now. I really don't even know what the hell it is. I mean, I'm kind of like grasp it. I don't really care. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't have an opinion one way or the other, except I know it's happening. And and I suppose we're getting into it. Or should I say more particularly, you and Gene are getting into it. <laughs> so Keith, Keith has disappeared. So. I will go back to this. The thing is, how bright do I want um, to? And thank you. Yep. Comments. Um, You're back coming. again? Yep, I'm back again if you can hear me. I can hear you. All right, I guess so. We jumped off NFTs. Uh, yeah, that's something I know very little about. I know that you guys are working on that, and that's all I know. Yeah, and that's fine. You don't really need to know more than that. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know that there's, people. There's, what? There's a the the NFT conversation is a. It's a multifaceted conversation uh, that can be discussed from uh, a, a multitude of angles. And yeah. uh, it's, you know, it's, it, you know. Yeah, yeah, I got we'll, it. We'll see. You know, we got to see, we got to see what happens. I know that people spend, have spent some outrageous amount of money on things that are not even a, a real thing. It's purely digital. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. But I mean, I get, it. I can understand that. It's it's another form of. Oh, oh, okay. It's a conversation oh, about. It's a conversation about value. Yes. yes. You know, it's like gold. Gold has no freaking value. It's only an agreement between people that has it. It has a value. It, there's no intrinsic value any more than 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 this has a value. If everybody was to agree that this was the value of gold and the conversation was in place, then they'd be, it's a, it's an agreement in a conversation between peoples. Yep. And I can get that, that this now is a new conversation, that there's a value here. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, things are valued and unvalued throughout time. Artwork. Yes. Right, yeah. You could yep. you couldn't give comic book art away, or co or animation art away in the past. Nobody wanted it. it was thrown away. They there was no value to it. What? Yeah, uh, yeah. They threw it away in dumpsters. All the the uh, Prince Valiant stuff. All that stuff. You know, <laughs> trashed. So, but so in that in and in that, well, the value to me is, of, well, the object of the itself, and the fact that it is. It's a handmade piece by Hal Foster, a Prince Valiant page. I knew he drew yes. it. You know, there's something I value that. Other people don't value that. Yep. So it's about an agree again. 
it's a different form of agreement to what's of value. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's all it's, uh, yeah, very much like the collectible market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like old toys. How much old toys? All or right, hem, I'm flipping hem, back hem. to some of the old, old, the older comments here. Uh, someone is asking about your old uh, self-portrait. So they have they have a Hildebrandt bo uh, book that uh, paint, you did a painting in 1974. You're in a top hat and glasses, reflecting spaceships. Yep. Do you remember this painting and what was its meaning? <laughs> I have it hanging up in my collectible room. I'm yes. <laughs> overseeing all my. Co I, I have it on a wall with all my old. It's it. My portrait is observing all the old comics and toys of that room. It's where it hangs. I started that one day. One night out of just, I felt like doing a self portrait. It was just for no other reason. So I started probably at two in the morning. I normally ever work at night. Once in a while I do. And I just said, what the hell? I looked at myself in the mirror and started painting a picture. And I had this old top hat. And when I, when I got to the glasses, I had the eyes all painted in. And I just stared at it. And I said, eh. I like flying saucers are cool. Because I've always had a flying saucer hang up since I was a kid, you know? Tim and I used to yeah. spend entire evenings sitting out on the porch in the back of our house of studying the skies. Tim would sit there for an hour. He would come back in. I would go out and I would sit there for an hour. And we did that for maybe a six, seven, eight months straight once. <laughs> Waiting to see a flying saucer. We, we saw lots of comets, shooting stars, people call them, but no flying saucers. Never abducted, never got abducted. No, I never got abducted that I know of. But, I mean, Hope it could have been wiped it. out, you know what I mean? I don't know. True. <laughs> but I like flying saucers, you know. It just, there's, I like, it's, they're, it's one of those things, you know. So I've stuck it in you my know, eyes. Have you, have you ever watched the show Ancient Aliens? Uh, yeah, it's been out for a while, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I just, it was. I just started it's one of the most ridiculous things ever, but there's something uh, there's fun. A guilty pleasure. Of course, they are. And the Anunnaki. Hear these guys talk about the Anunnaki and <laughs> that the, in the in the Sumerian it's Anunnaki, and in the Old Testament it's Nephilim or Nephilim, however you pronounce that, right? Those who yeah. came from up there. Yes, it's great it, stuff. It, of Zechariah Sitchin, he was the lunatic man. He wrote like seven books on that, I think on the Anunnaki there it was like I, I can't imagine the guy was just his whole life was about proving trying to show that this was real you know he'd travel around the world and see all these monuments and you know pyramids and everything and old cave caves and, and uh, anyway it's endless it's it's a treat oh, oh, I don't oh, believe look I don't believe any of that you know it's like all the conspiratorial shit I don't believe any of that stuff but when it comes to uh, aliens, of course, I mean, the possibility is very strong. We've been insane to, and so vastly egotistical to think that they there was not life elsewhere. Come on. There's no two ways yes. about it. I, I like to say that I don't believe anything, but I believe, in the, I believe in the possibility of everything. You know, the possibility. That's probably, that's probably a good way to be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like whatever. All possible. <laughs> Flying saucers. The right. Earth versus the Flying Saucers, Ray Harryhausen. Come on. <laughs> well, the one in the day the Earth stood still, where it lands in Washington. The yes. hatch opens and Klaatu and Gort walk out. That's a great film. Yep. Just warning America about getting off their shit, right? And the world, actually. So we've got another comment here. Uh, I'm going to address it from Michael. Again, today's the day of me not being able to. Uh, pronounce last names cuff shuff shoof sorry michael <laughs> either way he says uh greg has always inspired me with his use of warm and cool colors what are some of his top color tips that he likes to share with emerging artists michael do yourself a favor and watch this whole series of greg's live streams he talks a lot about his color theory his use of lighting and things like that. 
you're going to pick up a lot of good stuff, not only from, again, from the Just Trying to Get It Right series, but his other painting demos that he has up on YouTube. You can hear Greg talk about it for hours. All right. I saw Gene peek her head in. Hi, Gene. Yeah, hi, Gene. How's it going? The key, though, the answer is if there's a cool light, there's a warm shadow. If there's a warm light, there's a cool shadow. Cool light, warm shadow, warm light, cool shadow. That's a kind of a base platform. Just think about that for a while and go observe light, study light. I would say study light before you even make any moves to paint it. See what it's doing. Look at the color of a light and look at it shining on an object and see what color that object is and see that that, colored, that color of that object has been dictated by the color of the light shining on it. So white under a orange light looks orangey. White under a sheet of white paper, say, under a warm colored light is going to look slightly warmish yellowy. A piece of white paper under a blue colored light is going to look slightly bluish. So the color of light determines the color of all the objects in the scene or whatever it is you're painting. Color of light's cool. critical. The color of light is absolutely critical. So we've got another thing that's going to lead us to a different conversation and perhaps introduce Lance to a whole slew of your artwork that he might not be familiar with. Lance asks, what are your thoughts on nudity in art? Uh, it's been around forever. <laughs> My thoughts about nudity mean whether I should paint without clothes on or? <laughs> no, I mean, I've been painting nudes since I was aware of nudes. You know, in drawing them, I think everybody, that's one of the things you do. Nudes have been, what do you mean? The question is, look at he the Sistine ceiling. You're with the American Beauty series. Let's, yeah, let's I got so a pinup series. Yeah, but Keith, you, know, you really have to make a distinction here. Are we talking about full frontal nudity or are we talking about what Greg does, which is nudity from the waist up, but never from the waist down? Well, well, he just says, what are your thoughts on nudity in art? So, okay, if you want to make that distinction, do you have a distinction on nudity in art? Uh, I have no distinction. I mean, nudity is nudity and clothes are clothes. I mean, I, I mean, I, I have to have a more specific question, you know? He'd paint okay, a full well, nude, I'm... Keith. That's not the issue. I mean, he, if he was painting just nudes, okay, um... You know, straight nudes, what you know, fine art nudes. Okay, I don't think it would matter at all. But when you're doing pinup art, it, it really you have to look at your audience and you have to look at where it's going to hang in their in their homes, in their garages, in their man caves, whatever. And and so you're probably not going to do full nudity in pinup art. Well, but look at but look at the Sistine ceiling. There's full nudity all over the place. Not hanging in anybody's garage. It's hanging in a cathedral <laughs> in, the, in the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> but but you yourself, obviously, knowing your art, have no problem with nudity. Not in the least. In art. Now, no, it's, you... it's one of the things that you draw when you start to draw. I've had the Andrew Loomis, the human figure for all it's worth, the book which I would recommend to any young artist, or old artist for that matter, uh, Andrew Loomis, his illustration book and his book on drawing the human figure. I had that when I was starting high school, 14 years old. And and then, uh, so I've, you know, I've been doing new, new drawings for forever and paintings. So it's just one of the other things you do as an artist. Yeah. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't up here or it isn't down here. It's just one of the other things you do. If he's asking me whether I have a moral hang-up about it, absolutely not at all. Yeah. If that's the question, morality, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, as Betty, I, I, I think it's, I'm paraphrasing Betty Page, the great model. She said, mm -hmm. God made the human body, humans made clothes. <laughs> that's kind of cute. I think that's kind of cute. It is cute. And... You know, maybe this says something about me. I don't know. I think it's a good addition. I'm not not in a puritanical sense of where everybody needs to be buttoned up all the time. But clothes kind of make 
some mystery there. Oh, I, I it, it, absolutely. You know, sure. there's the there's the intrigue. Yeah, the intrigue. So, yeah, humans got creative with it. Yep. Oh, thanks, Dean Thirteen. I'm having trouble miss uh, with the pronunciation of last last name. So Dean Thirteen busting my chops that he's going to make accounts with more <laughs> difficult names every week. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that one. <laughs> so I mean, I, I don't know whether that answers anything, but. Uh... I found it. I think yes. we talked about this the last time about I, when I went, I had six months of art school. I wanted to be an animator and I kept writing letters to Disney about what I had to do to apply for an animator's position. And they said, go to a school that focuses on life drawing, perspective and anatomy. And we found one in Detroit, Tim and me, believe it or not, great school, old line school. After we did, got out of the army and a six months active duty, we were in the reserves and we, we went to the school. It was a six month course. And one of the, it was a life drawing and he, Focus on that. That was a pre, predominant focus for the school. You do a whole week of life drawing. And then the, the second week was anatomy, perspective, color, and design. And we never had a painting class. We learned the theory of light and color, light and its impact on color in that class. And I draw nudes for a whole week, you know, and, uh, you know, 10 second poses, 60 second poses, two hour poses, four, you know, a whole mix of things. He, he uh, actually, he, ex he expanded on the conversation and actually takes it to a, s a slightly different realm, which is, it's interesting here. He says that erotica seems to help uh, grab more attention. He's a tattoo artist and he's like, he's doing a red Sonia. If it's a topless red Sonia, it's gonna, it sells better. Uh, okay. Which. So it's talking about sales. Absolutely. Absolutely true. That's absolutely true. That's an old adage of sex sells always has. Yeah. And it always will. Yeah. But he's wondering, does it cheapen the art? If you are using that to arouse the viewer, uh, as well as amaze the viewer, like uh, why using, it, it, I guess using nudity as a gimmick almost. Well, nudity is a gimmick. Well, everything's a gimmick in that sense, then, if you want to analyze it. Light is a gimmick. Color is a gimmick. You know, gimmick. They're all, they're all, they're all there to attract your attention, to pull you in, however you do that, you know, within certain limitations, of course. You're not going to do anything that's uh, uh, abusive to, you know, I don't know what term to use. You know what I'm saying? But in terms of art and it's a, it's an old, I mean, Puritan, you know, we went to Europe and I had all my pinup art there. There's no hang up about nudity. And, you know, we, they had the posters, parents bring their kids. And here with the, in this country, the Puritans, I think, you know, had a large impact. Did they not? Yes. And that's almost blasphemous to me that you would make the human body a sinful thing. It's not to use their jargon, blasphemy. No. If they believe that God made everything, if, if, if you believe that God made everything, then that, then everything's good. Yes. Or, you know, I mean, that's a whole different conversation. Of it sure the, is. <laughs> the, the usage of everything, you know, what is the usage of it? Yeah. But I'm going to, you know, in my, in my, in my opinion, uh, to comment on what you know what Lance said it, it really comes down to to you and, and your personal preference on what you feel comfortable with if you feel like you're cheapening something because you you know you took the bra off then then you know stick to your own guns and, and don't do it but right. uh exactly but if that, if that doesn't bother you and it helps you make a living man it helps you feed your family and helps keep food on your table, then do what you got to do. I mean, uh, you know what? 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 Damn it! I like to know is what harm does it do? Nudity. Who is it damaging? If you do a nude yeah, drawing or a painting, an artist does a nude. I mean, does this hurt somebody? Does it damage somebody? Does it? What's it do? I mean, uh, is. I mean, is it like they they want to blame uh, people who come up with this kind of shit? They they want to blame art. I don't know what they owe. I'm not saying Lance, but open yeah, up the yeah, conversation. People 
people love to point at the arts and blame the arts for everything. The arts, film, painting, drawing, sculpting, you name it, games. This causes kids to go stark raving mad, become juvenile delinquents. This causes people to go rape each other. This causes this, this causes that, this causes that. They've always aimed their guns at, at the arts over the centuries. You know, yeah. I find that interesting. You know, that's a whole yeah. book of 20 books in themselves, isn't it? It is. And I mean, you know, we, we've briefly talked about that before. You know, the it's easier to blame someone else than to accept personal responsibility. Totally. In that nope. case, you know, like, and even just what you said just a few minutes ago of, you know, why is it wrong for, you know, like television violence or an artistic nude, but, but real world it's, global scale war. Is, they, get, they get medals pinned on there. They yeah, get awards and, and uh, medals and commendations for mass murder. And, I mean, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't want to get into a whole anti-war thing, but. Yeah. And we, I will point out, too, that you did serve in the military. You were I did. Military. I was in the Army. And I, and if I was called into if combat, I was between Vietnam and, and Korea. So I never was in combat. If I was called back, then I would have gone. I sure would have gone. I, there's no toys about it. I would have. Yep. In fact, the, the closest we ever came to was on, our unit was on standby alert, as every unit in the country was in, in Pontiac, Michigan, where I, where I was uh, in the reserves. Uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis. They said, go home and pack your duffel bag, which we did and kept it by the door ready to go. And I would have gone and whatever would have happened. So, yeah, no, I'm not I'm not an anti-military. Don't take me wrong. I'm not anti-soldiers. I think I know a lot of them and they're, and they're fantastic human beings. I'm not saying that, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a edgy conversation, you know. It is an edgy conversation, yes. But it's... You know... I, th it, I think that you can... I think that you can be supportive of of the military you can be supportive of the need of the military you yeah. can be supportive of the usage of the military and still question uh is this the proper time and place to use the military of course i think that's being responsible it's being a responsible citizen to yeah. to truly weigh the consequences of of asking someone else to put their lives on the line yeah. and asking someone else to take someone else's life. That's, to that's, live a, with that. a, that's a massive responsibility. So I think it's fine to question whether it's something that we should or should not be doing at any given time. Absolutely. And yet, you, you know, know, you support the military completely. I do. I mean, Absolutely. without, without it, you know, where would we be? You know, we would have been overrun a long, long time ago. A long time ago. A long time ago. So it's just, just like it, Hong Kong getting overrun by Godzilla and Kong in that movie. <laughs> there would there be nothing that you could do to stop the overrunning. No. No, that that's but that you know the whole thing, war and peace and that that's a oh my god, that's a tough conversation. It's it's hard to have it, you know, in a way. It's it's a difficult conversation. It is. It's not just simple. It's not easy. It's not. No, way. It's not no. binary. Is that the word? It's not one way or the other. It's. it's yeah. It multifaceted. Is. It's. It's all over the place. Yep. Absolutely. And it's interesting place to get to from you know a, a Kong versus a multi fantasy or Godzilla well, versus multi headed. But and, and, it, uh, but without conflict, what kind of art would we have had throughout history? Conflict has created some of the greatest masterpieces of all time. Absolutely. In paint and film and drama and, and music. Music. Absolutely. And music. It's you know. It's like you you can't. It's yin and yang. It's 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 up and down. It's hot and cold. It's it's all left and right. It's you know. Yep. It's all part of one thing. Lance, thanks you for your service, Greg. And uh... well, look at—I mean, I 
like I say again, I was never in combat, so those who were, I have the ultimate uh, respect for. And I, there's no toys about that. To 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 do that, you know, it's 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 incredible. But these are interesting conversations. Yeah, very interesting. Art, you know, it's like. You wonder how long we would have survived without art, the human race. Yeah, I, I think yeah, we would have wiped. I, th I think possibly that's. I have no evidence to support it. But I think it's kind of like probably contributed to at least to our survival, to some degree. Keith, you're frozen. Well, we gotta wait till Keith comes back so he can say the goodbyes. Okay. <laughs> Am I back? Can you hear me? You're back. It just it, everything shut off and then and then came back on. The uh, the survival of the art for our survival due to our. You're off again. I'll wait for you to come back. We're talking, I started a conversation, we were talking about war and and, and everything, and, and then I, I I made the statement that there's no evidence to support it that I know of, but I think that art really, without art, we would have wiped the, ourselves out eons ago. Well, that's, he, he started to respond, and then he froze up, and he's, he's coming great. back. He's coming back. He's coming back. Keith is coming back. Hey, how you doing, Greg? I'm back. I'm all right. So okay. Keith, you were going to okay. finish your statement about okay. survival. Okay, but you're at a quarter after five now, so just so you know that. Did you hear me? Your your sound is off, Keith. Can't hear you. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Seriously, we really don't know why. Because I guess it's just that Keith lives out in West Jersey somewhere and they don't have the same kind of signals the rest of the planet has. But we love him. He does a fabulous job. Uh, if you're enjoying Greg on these live streams, tune in. It's Thursday at 4 o'clock no matter what. And uh, like us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and God knows where. And we have all sorts of wonderful things on Spiderweb Art. Dot com. Isn't he cute? Look how cute he is. Cute. He's so cute. He's so cute. <laughs> Anyhow, and, um, and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for coming. Goodbye, Keith. I can't hear you, but goodbye.